the Honorable Majority Leader's objection seeks to question the propriety of the decision to admit the motion number 55 on the said order paper. As defined in Order 7 of the Standing Orders, a motion, and I quote, means a proposal made by a member that Parliament or a committee thereof do something, order something to be done, or express an opinion concerning some matter, unquote. In simple terms, and in accordance with accepted practice and conventions of this House, a motion is a mechanism for decision making by the House because it sets in motion the process for arriving at a decision. Such a motion may be admitted by the Speaker to be moved if before the commencement of the sitting, the member submits to the Speaker a written notification of the matter to be raised. When a Speaker determines that a motion or a specific matter be moved, such a motion would be considered admitted and the member shall be allowed to move the motion accordingly. The Honorable Majority Leader further submitted forcefully that the motion listed as number 55 on the other paper is incompetent and ought to have been laid in the form of a paper for the information of the House. Implicit in this argument is the notion that when the report of a committee is laid as a paper, then its content is determinative and that this House cannot purport to take any further action on it by way of a debate and vote. This dichotomy that the Honorable Majority Leader sought to draw between a paper and a motion is, with all due respect, a false dichotomy. It is a comparison that does not yield accurate analytical outcomes. And I will proceed to demonstrate why this is so. The standing orders of this House provide for the pre presentation of papers. In terms of Order 74, papers may be presented only by the Speaker, the Chairman of a committee, a member, or a minister. The mode of presentation of papers is governed by Order 75, which provides, among others, that, and I quote, one, as soon as sufficient copies of a paper for distribution to members have been received in the office of the clerk, notice of the presentation of that paper may be placed on the other paper. And as soon as Mr. Speaker announces papers for presentation, the paper shall be deemed to have been laid on the table. Two, if so desired by the person presenting a paper, a short explanatory statement may be made by him upon his presentation, unquote. The tenor of the provisions on the presentation of papers suggests to me that the latitude of action regarding deliberation, debate, and decision is extremely restricted when papers are laid. However, it does not mean, as the majority leader sought to imply, that this House cannot take steps to adopt or approve such a paper by motion. As a matter of practice and convention of some parliaments, papers are laid for the information of the House and may not be the subject matter of deliberation, debate, and decision. But a paper that is in the form of a report of a committee of this House may be laid and debated using the method of a motion, save expressly and specifically accepted by law. This position is buttressed by the requirements of standing orders of this House, particularly Order 161, who stipulates that recommendations of a committee be presented in the House in the form of a report, and that, quote, 
at any time after the report has been presented to the House, a motion may be moved by the chairman of the committee for the acceptance of the report, unquote. See paragraph 2, order 161. This provision would definitely be rendered inutile if we were to accept the position adumbrated by the Honorable Majority Leader. Moreover, presidents from other jurisdictions support the view that I have taken of this matter. For instance, you can read a publication of the Parliament of Australia titled House of Representatives Practice, seventh edition, relating to the committee of, the, of that house known as a committee of privileges and members' interests. And that report details the practice following the laying of a report of the committee as follows, and I quote, on presentation of the committee's report to the house by the chair, the practice is for the report to be ordered to be made a parliamentary paper. The House may then order that it be taken into consideration at the next sitting or on a specified day. A motion or motions may be moved declaratory of the House's view on the committee's report and recommendations and in respect of the House's proposed action. Unquote. Also referred to the practice on this matter in New Zealand, India, particularly the Lok Sabha, United Kingdom, look at the rules of the House of Commons, Canada, and the United States of America. I have taken the trouble to go through all these rules. Having disposed of the question whether the report of the Committee on Privileges ought to have come by way of a motion or whether it ought to have been laid as a paper, I will now turn my attention to the substantive issue of whether the House sitting in plenary can consider the report of the Committee for purposes of its adoption. Honourable Members, you may recall that in my former statement on matters relating to the vacancy of the seat of a Member of Parliament, for reason of absence from Parliament. I provided a context on how the House ought to proceed on the matter of absenteeism and what steps should be taken in that respect. After a careful review of the constitutional provisions, outstanding orders, the case law, and the rules and practice of other parliaments around the world, on a matter of assentism of a member of parliament for citizens of parliament, I noted that a member or any person would be stopped from raising an issue of absenteeism after the meeting, and thus a member of parliament or any person that desires of doing the same must act timelessly during the course of the meeting that the member is alleged to have absented himself from the sentence. I also noted that the combined effect of our constitution, standing orders, and case law provides a certain process to be followed when it comes to a notice of the House that a member had absented himself or herself from the sentence of Parliament in a manner that is inconsistent with the letter and spirit of Article 971C of the 1992 Constitution. For the avoidance of doubt, I retreat what I highlighted in that statement, and I particularly will refer to paragraph 19 of the statement, and it reads as follows. 19. In the light of the combined reading of the provisions in the Constitution and the standing orders above, coupled with a decision of the Court of Appeal, on the question of when a seat of a member of parliament is vacant by reason of absenteeism, the following processes should be complied with. One, the member must have been absent from a meeting for 15 sittings in that meeting without the permission of the speaker in writing based on the evidence from the votes 
and proceedings of Parliament. Two, the fact of the absence of the member without permission of the Speaker may be raised on the floor of Parliament by a member, and the matter referred to a committee of privileges for consideration and report to the House. Three, the member so referred shall be required to offer an explanation for the absence to the Committee of Privileges, which shall consider whether the explanation is reasonable. Four, the Committee of Privileges, after consideration, shall recommend to the House such action as the Committee may consider appropriate. Five, the House shall vote on the recommendation of the Committee, where in the event that the Committee's recommendation to the House is to the effect that the member's explanation is reasonable, and the House adopts that recommendation, the member's seat shall not be declared vacant. Where in the event that the committee's recommendation to the House is to the effect that the member's explanation is unreasonable and the House adopts that recommendation, the member's seat shall be declared vacant by Mr. Speaker. Where Mr. Speaker has declared a seat vacant by reason of absenteeism, the clerk to Parliament shall within seven days of the declaration notify the Electoral Commission for the necessary processes for a by-election to commence." Unquote. Having regard to the process outlined above, the Committee of Privileges considered the matter of absenteeism involving the three members who had absented themselves from sittings of the House in a meeting without the permission in writing of the Speaker. I will give a fuller explanation of the role each of the actors plays in this matter, only if necessary, at the conclusion of this matter. Suffice for this purpose to restrain myself to the role of the Committee of Privileges. The Committee has a singular mandate in respect of these matters, and that is to establish that the member absented him or herself from the sitting of parliament for 15 days in the meeting without the permission of the speaker in writing require into the reasonableness as you say inquire not require inquire into the reasonableness or otherwise of the explanation offered by the affected member or members and to report to the House. Order 7 defines a standing committee like the Committee of Privileges as a committee appointed under Article 1031 of the Constitution to inquire into and report on such matters as we've referred to it from time to time or on a continuous basis for the declaration of parliament. The Committee of Privileges is a committee of parliament constituted pursuant to Article 103 of the Constitution. As a committee of parliament, the way in which the committee conducts itself is regulated by the standing orders of the House. It is provided by Article 1101 of the Constitution 1992 that, and I quote, subject to the provisions of the Constitution, Parliament may, by standing orders, regret its own proceedings." Unquote. Article 97 1C stipulates the conditions under which the seat of a member of Parliament may be vacant. Put differently, once the member has A, been absent from Parliament for 15 sittings of a meeting of Parliament, B, not obtain the permission of Mr. Speaker in writing to be absent, and C, cannot offer a reasonable explanation to the Parliamentary Committee on Privileges, the member automatically vacates the seat. This is the position that was endorsed 
In the case of Professor Stephen Kweku Asari versus the Attorney General and three others, unreported 2008 Court of Appeal. And I want to quote what they said. The plaintiff appellant, here is after referred to as the appellant, contends that once a member absents himself from parliament without explanation for more than 15 sittings in this case, that member's seat automatically becomes vacant by operation of law. This argument is sound in law and I accept it, unquote. On the other hand, Order 161 of the Standing Orders provides, one, the recommendations of a report or committee shall be presented to the House in the form of a report. Two, at any time after the report has been presented to the House, a motion may be moved by the chairman of the committee for the acceptance of the report. Our orders specifically require that the recommendations of a committee must be subject to the consideration of the House, and that the plenary plays an important role in choosing to adopt or reject the recommendations. The rationale for this structure is that committees of parliament are macrocosms and extensions of the House as a whole. They are handmaidens whose core constitutional function is to assist parliament. In the language of Article 1031 of the Constitution, in, I quote, the effective discharge of its functions, unquote. There are, however, a few exceptions to this general rule. As noted by the majority leader, Articles 106, 13, and that's cross 13, and 177 provide instances where the Committee of Parliament's work oppressed to automatically bind the House, and no consideration was is required by the plenary in these matters. May I add that it is also the case with the recommendations of the Committee of Members holding office of profit. In such instances, the Constitution specifically says so. Very clear, clearly stated in the Constitution. Most parliamentary decisions are made by the House acting on the recommendations of one of its committees. It does not follow that all decisions in Parliament may be done that way. Where the Constitution itself specifies a particular process for deciding, then it is that process that must be followed. This is because general things do not derogate from special things. However, in contrast with these instances cited, there is nothing, and I mean nothing, expressly stated or necessarily implied in Article 971C to effect that the conclusion of the work of the Committee of Privileges also concludes the matter. And no action may be taken by the House on the findings and recommendations of the Committee. Furthermore, the instances cited are not referrals from the House to the Committee of the House. At the West 77, for instance, indicates that the advances from the contingency fund may be authorized by the Committee for Finance once the Committee is satisfied that there has arisen an urgent or unforeseen need for expenditure for which no other provision exists to meet the need. The plenary in this case is not seized with jurisdiction to make a reference or determination on the decision of the Committee for Finance. In fact, the Constitution says the Committee in charge of financial matters. The distinction between this provision and Article 971C is that in the case of the former, no reference made by the House in any way to the Committee for Finance. The Minister responsible for finance 
in making a request for an advance for the contingency fund is not required to come to the House, but can submit his request to a committee for finance. The House plays no role in the process. The Constitution mandates the Minister of Finance after the authorization of the Committee of Finance to as soon as possible present a supplementary estimate for the purpose of replacing the amount so advanced. That's what is stated in the Constitution. And that is very different from the position in that Article 97.1c. On the contrary, in relation to the matter before us, the absenteeism of the three members is referred to the committee in accordance with Article 97.1c after the allegation that the members were absent for 15 days without permission in writing by the Speaker. A committee of the House is then called upon to inquire into the allegations and report to the House for a decision. I find the position canvassed strongly by the Majority Leader as untenable for the simple reason that where the framers of the Constitution intended that a committee be clothed with exclusive jurisdiction on a matter without reference to the House, it has expressly, as in the case of Article 106, 13, and 177, indicated so within the text of the Constitution. To the extent that a similar express mandate is not conferred on the Privileges Committee in respect of matters arising under Article 971C, Parliament's procedure with respect to the committees must, of necessity, apply. To imply any mandate into Article 971C is one I am not prepared to do. Pursuant to Article 110 of the Constitution, my understanding is that when the Constitution does not provide a procedure, Parliament may regulate the procedure within that space as long as it does not offend the Constitution. It is in accordance with this power that Parliament captured the dictates of Article 71C in Order 161, which is to the effect that once a member is alleged to be in breach of the provision, his conduct is referred to the Committee of Privileges for inquiry. For the purpose of reiterating my humble view, once a referral has been made, therefore, the report of the committee does not complete the inquiry into the matter. The report of the Committee of Privileges, just like any other committee, is subject to the consideration of the House by way of a motion. Again, I am inspired and convinced this provision of the law by the provision of the Constitution, rules of procedure and practice of the United Kingdom, India, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. In conclusion, honorable members, as I have noted in this ruling, the decision as to whether or not to admit a motion is the exclusive preserve of the speaker. In view of the foregoing, the House is well within its rights to receive and consider the report of the committee and make a determination arising out of the recommendations. In the circumstances, it is my ruling that the motion was rightfully admitted and the report of the committee is subject to the consideration of the House. It goes, it goes, it goes without saying that the preliminary objection of the majority leader to the admissibility of the motion for consideration of the report of the committee is hereby dismissed in limine.
Honorable members, I did indicate that I will give my understanding at the end of the debate on this matter, and I'll give you copious referral notes on this issue. Was it's my humble view that even what the table office does in trying to compute the days that a member absents himself is not final. It's for the committee to investigate and establish the facts. Again, the fact that the speaker, or it's alleged that the speaker has not given permission in writing, is also not final. Evidence must be produced before the committee. And the last thing is for the committee. The fact that the committee says, oh, this reason is reasonable. This reason is not reasonable. It's not also final. It's for the House that will go through it because the mandate given to an MP representation is so crucial that it cannot be left to the subjective view of any person or group of people, but the whole House. Please, honorable members, table office will accordingly list the motion, and this House will continue to deliberate and debate on it and take a final decision. Yeah.